Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the that generous uh, introduction. So I'll just share my screen. Yeah. And uh, I hope everyone is able to see. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I'll say, straight away begin with my topic. So the topic for today is endocrinopathies and diabetes. Um, so this is the other diabetes. As we all know, type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes, these continue to be the most common forms of diabetes. However, there are certain rarer forms of diabetes which may occur as a consequence or in fact as a part of other endocrinopathies. It has been estimated that 1-2% to 2 of all the cases might be due to a secondary cause. So when, do we sh when should we suspect that it might be an endocrine cause? So first, if there is a type 2 diabetes who doesn't fit the bill, uh, for example, somebody who, has a, who is a young guy age at onset, who is non-obese, or somebody with the type 2 diabetes, which is rapidly progressing uh, for maybe over a period of two to three years, somebody has gone from being well controlled on one OAD to two to three OADs, uh, and then now maybe on insulin, the patient is not controlled or has suddenly and unexpectedly progressed to diabetic ketoacidosis. Then in case of certain incidentalomas, so like an adrenal tumor, pituitary or a pancreatic tumor needs to be investigated, of course, for the presence of uh, hyperglycemia. There might be other pointers, some syndromic features like in men one, we might have neuromas or the classical features of hormonal excess like uh, uh, Cushing, Cushingoid features or ac acromegaloid features. These might point towards a possible endocrinopathy which might be associated. So these are the endocrinopathies that we'll be discussing. Um, and I'll be discussing them through cases just to make it a little less boring. So the first case here, we have a Mr. X, 39-year-old male, who presented with complaints of increased sweating and acne, coarsening of facial features, shortness of breath, which he developed last three years, and uh, frequent change in shoe size, and sh shoe size and uh, tightening of rings of the on fingers. He had a history of uh, hypertension as well as CHF. He was, treated, he was being treated with antihypertensives and all, was also on oral antibiotic agents. Uh, so as we can see, the patient has post facial features. Uh, there is a fleshy nose. There is frontal prominence, prognathism. The uh, palms were very fleshy. The, these are the compare. This, this is comparing his arm, his hand, with his father's hand, which is clearly bigger and larger. So on investigation, uh, the head had, the, there was macrocephaly. Uh, the nose was large, fleshy. The oral examination showed malaligned jaws. All in all, there, there were a myriad of acromegaloid features which were present. We went for a growth hormone analysis. The basal was raised and then we subsequently sub subjected the patient to a, gl a glucose suppression test for growth hormone. The suppression on suppression, which ideally the, uh, the nadir should have been below 1, was came out to be 11. And thus a diagnosis of acromegaly was made. We went ahead with an MRI and uh, we were able to uh, diagnose and pinpoint a pituitary microadenoma. So these were the patient's uh, preoperative glycemic levels. The patient was taking glycolazide 30 mg, cetagliptin as well as metformin. His uh, fasting blood glucose levels were around 160 and postprandial after breakfast were 300. So the dominant mechanism for this hyperglycemia is of course IGF-1 induced insulin resistance uh, along with certain other minor contributors which we will be discussing. Uh, the post-operative glycemic control at around uh, on the third or the fourth uh, post-op days if I'm remembering correctly, the patient started experiencing hypoglycemic episodes and this was off medications. So this was because of the fact that uh, post-surgery the patient developed hydrogenic hypopituitarism. There was hypocortisolism and along with the, the decline in the growth hormone uh, levels led to this situation where the patient was developing recurrent hypoglycemic episodes. So acromegaly, like we've already discussed, slowly progressive disease with the chronic uh, excess of growth hormones. Uh, it, has, uh, it is highly debilitating, severe comorbidities, which include cardiovascular, respiratory, even increased neoplastic uh, risks. Uh, the prevalence of diabetes in patients with acromegaly, um, in, in, there, there have been a very few studies. This was one study which I was able to find, where in comparison to normal people, there was an increased risk 
of around 52.5% uh, patients with acromegaly were diagnosed with diabetes. So the pathophysiology of hypoglycemia when we talk in, hyper, uh, in acromegaly, so growth hormone in adipose tissue leads to increased lipolysis, which leads to increased free fatty acid, increasing the insulin resistance. Similarly, at the level of the liver, the kidney, there is increased uh, gluconeogenesis. Uh, at liver, there is increased glycogenolysis. IGF-1 is, of course, also increased uh, in uh, the liver, by the liver. Uh, pancreas, it acts on all of this, acts on the pancreas, leading to increased insulin secretion. All of this contributes and contributes towards producing a state where there is hyperglycemia, uh, increased insulin resistance, and thus type 2 diabetes. So the effect of treatment. So we went for the for this patient. We went for a transphenoidal surgery, like I've already mentioned. But the patient become high became hypoglycemic. Talking about talking generally about acromegaly patients, both radiotherapy and transphenoidal surgeries are associated with decrease in uh, growth hormone levels and uh, so with associated decrease in uh, blood glucose levels as well. There are there is also medical management. So, and the first, first line are the somatostatin analogs. There are first generation somatostatin analogs, which include octreotide, lambreotide. These have minimal effect on the glycemic levels. However, the newer uh, 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 somatostatin analog, which is perseriotide, which has greater affinity towards uh, somatostatin receptor 1, 3, and 5, has, is notorious for causing hyperglycemia. Pegvisomant again. Uh, decreases IGF-1 and there, therefore has been proven and been shown to decrease the fasting insulin level as well as fasting glucose and HbA1c. Moving on, uh, so this is case 2. Uh, this was a 16-year-old boy with weakness of proximal muscles, purplish stria, increased abdominal fat. He, he also was diagnosed with, type, with diabetes and uh, uh, hypertension. He was being controlled with the insulin and was an antihypertensive. This is the classical uh, the, the classical presentation. In the patient, there was uh, moon facies, facial plethora, dorsal cervical fat pad, neck acanthosis. The classical Cushingoid features were present. This is the pur purplish stria that I was mentioning. We went for uh, the basal cortisol, which was raised. The overnight dexamethasone, the low de dose dexamethasone, all showed and pointed towards possibly a pituitary uh, adenoma secreting ACTH. Therefore, we went for a dynamic uh, contrast with the pituitary uh, and pituitary microadenoma was diagnosed. Transfer, we subjected the patient to transphenoidal surgery. Again, going again, back to the pre-operative uh, glycemic profile, the fasting blood glucose was very high. Despite being on insulin, uh, it was 240. Post breakfast was 320. And the mechanism involved, as we all know, it was the decreased insulin post receptor activity, inhibition of GLUT4 activity, increased gluconeogenesis by stimulation of Pepsi K, and uh, increased glucagon production. The post operative glycemic profile improved a lot, and this was at one month. As of now, I can say that the patient is controlled without any medications. He is not a euglycemic. So Cushing syndrome, it can be due to both autonomous cortical cortisol production by the adrenals or secondary to raised ACTH production, even exogenous uh, uh, cortisol administration, glucocorticoid administration can lead to exogenous Cushing's. Um, and when we talk about the incidence of diabetes in patients with Cushing syndrome, it can vary, but uh, most studies uh, usually put it around 35 to 47%, and IGT is equally high. The pathophysiology, like we've discussed, so in the, there is increased visceral obesity, decreased growth hormone secretion, muscle mass decreases, glycogen synthesis decreases, the beta cell function decre is decreased, incretin secretion is decreased. All of this cumulatively leads to a situation where it, due to the increased the glucocorticoids, there is hyperglycemia. Effect of treatment. So same as acromegaly, the first line is, of course, transphenoidal surgery. Radiotherapy is also features right up there. Along with the decrease in the cortisol level, the glycemic profile also improves. Medical management, barring stereotype, which we've already discussed, which worsens hyperglycemia and has been proven to 
uh, do so. Uh, all the other uh, medications, be it ketoconazole, metyrapone, oscillodrostat, which is a recent addition to this armamentarium, uh, metotain, all lead to decreased cortisol level and thus improvement in uh, uh, glycemic profile. Moving on to the third case. So this, is a, this was a case of 76-year-old female, uh, known case of diabetes for the last three years. Uh, she had an HbA1c of around 6.9. She was on metformin. Uh, she had weight loss, increased forgetfulness. Uh, she denied any complaints of increased sweating since we were suspecting hyperthyroidism. But there was no increased sweating, heat intolerance or change in bowel habits. Uh, she had a thin build, listlessness, apathy. There was tachycardia as well as hypertension. So I mentioned, already mentioned the drug she was on. So on the routine examination, the fasting blood sugars were uh, 140, postprandial blood glucose was 160. Uh, we prescribed her uh, thyroid profile because the patient, keeping in mind the thin build and the history of recent weight loss, it came out that she had hyperthyroidism. It was probably apathetic hyperthyroidism considering her uh, increased age. We went for a technetium scan, which confirmed the diagnosis. We started on her, started her on methimazole. And about three months after starting, once the thyroid profile had normalized, uh, she became euglycemic and we were able to uh, keep take her off medications. So hyperthyroidism, we all know what hyperthyroidism is. Uh, prevalence of hyperthyroidism in diabetes. So it's the other way around. Uh, in diabetic population, roughly 4.4% of people have been diagnosed to have uh, thyroid dysfunction towards hyperthyroidism. Uh, several mechanisms have been attributed to the cause of hyperglycemia in hyperthyroidism. Most common is the increased glucose production leading to impaired glucose control. Uh, similarly, the, there is increased glucose absorption by the GI tract, increased uh, appetite, there are uh, hyper hyperproinsulinemia, increased free fatty acids, increased insulin resistance. So this is just to summarize what all effects uh, hyperthyroidism has on the glucose profile. All of these factors in combination lead to increased glucose levels and uh, therefore it becomes imperative to check and treat in case if there is hyperthyroidism. Um, case four. So this was a patient. He was a 31-year-old male. Uh, he presented to us with recurrent episodes of proximal episodes of headache, sweating, palpitations. These episodes lasted for about 5 to 10 minutes. There were no aggravating or relieving factors. Um, the episodes resolved spontaneously. But we went for the patient was classically presenting as a few chromocytoma episodes. Uh, we went for the metanephrine, urinary metanephrine. The non metanephrine was very highly raised. We went for uh, radiological imaging. This was the CT scan, which was done the, according to the uh, adrenal protocol of the patient. And uh, as it is clearly shown, uh, there were bilateral adrenal masses. Uh, we also went for an MRI of the chest because the HRCT initially had shown some mass. We weren't available, we weren't able to uh, discern what it was. Uh, and uh, the MRI showed a parasternal mass, which could possibly been uh, would have been paraganglioma. So we went for a cesta maybe, which showed two paragangliomas in the chest and two pheochromocytomas. So coming back to our topic for the day, uh, glycemic profile of the patient in the fasting blood glucose was uh, not in the diabetic range. However, the two hours post breakfast, uh, it was high. The mechanism is, of course, we know that alpha adrenergic effect it produces insulin secretion. Beta adrenergic, it increases hepatic glycogenolysis. And uh, the increased uh, circulating fatty acids, it leads to increased insulin resistance. Post-operatively, the patient's uh, blood glucose levels came down. Patient became a non-diabetic post-surgery. So we all know what pheochromocytoma is. It's a catecholamine secreting tumors, uh, rare neoplasm. Uh, it is estimated that uh, annual incidence is very low of uh, pheochromocytoma, but the patients who present with such classical symptoms of paroxysmal episodes of hypertension, 
must be evaluated for a possible cause which might be a pheochromocytoma. Uh, the physiology of hyperglycemia is that alpha-1 receptors, like we've already mentioned, uh, there is uh, decreased GLP-1 secretion, uh, increased uh, glucagon secretion, increased free fatty acids, uh, decreased insulin, uh, decreased GLP-1, and all of this cumulatively leads to uh, hyperglycemia. So yeah, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, I'm so sorry, I haven't encountered any cases of uh, glucagonoma or somatostatinoma. So I'll just recapitulate just the theory. Uh, so the neuroendocrine tumors, they constitute a heterogeneous group of neoplasms. Uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which include both glucagonoma as well as uh, somatostatinoma, these are frequently associated with dysglycemia. Um, Again, there is a high uh, chance that the patient with uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors will have uh, dysglycemia or uh, diabetes. Glucogonoma, of course, is one of the synchronon of uh, one of the four Ds of the classical uh, uh, symptomology of glucogonoma. Somatostatinoma, on the other hand, it is extremely rare. It presents with diabetes, diarrhea, gallbladder. However, diabetes is not very severe. Uh, the diabetes is because that is probably a part of because the somatostatin inhibits both insulin and glucagon and this differential inhibition is probably uh, the explanation for the mild degree of hyperglycemia which is seen. Uh, effect of treatment. So the treatment is pancreatectomy and we all know pancreatectomy especially where the head or the tail is being excised can itself lead to pancreatogenic diabetes. Uh, and in a large study group, it was shown that 4.8 to 39% of such patients developed pancreatic, pancreatogenic diabetes postoperatively. Uh, treatment by somatostatin analogs, we've already discussed. Um, now, there are certain factors that we need to consider here. Although there are no set guidelines for the treatment of diabetes in pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors, however, metformin has been shown that it has anti proliferative properties. Uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are also uh, are being tried for treatment of insulinoma in animal experimental studies. DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs, the incretin therapy, has, a, has an effect on the regenerative effect on the pancreatic islet cells. Additionally, GLP-1 RAs, uh, are, it's a contraindication with patients with medullary carcinoma thyroid, which, is it, which in itself is a neuroendocrine tumor. So, all of these factors should be kept in mind. However, the, as far the guidelines are concerned, there is no specific uh, treatment approach to uh, patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Yeah, finally, uh, primary hyperaldosteronism or the aldosteronoma. Uh, primary aldosteronism, it's a group of uh, disorders in which aldosterone production is high. Uh, this leads to increased sodium and the low uh, potassium concentration. This causes hypertension, it can cause cardiovascular damage, sodium retention, suppression of plasma renin. It is uh, most commonly caused by an adrenal adenoma. The prevalence, uh, it has been widely accepted now that it is underreported because we also tend to associate hyperaldosteronism with hypokalemia. However, in the recent studies, incidence as high as 10% has been reported in hypertensive patients who have been normally. So the mechanism of hyperglycemia, uh, it's predominantly, so pancreas, uh, there is hypokalemia. We know hypokalemia leads to reduced uh, insulin secretion that, and in addition to adipocytes where there is uh, inhibition of insulin receptor mRNA leading to insulin resistance. And all of this uh, leads to increased uh, blood glucose levels in patients with primary hyperaldosteronism. Yeah. So finally, to summarize, uh, postparental hyperglycemia, like we've seen, is a common occurrence in diabetes due to endocrine causes. Reversal or at least improvement is usually seen as a natural phenomena or as a post-therapy adjunct. Every time uh, these tumors are treated, uh, hyperglycemia at least improves. If it doesn't, it completely is not cured, it does improve. Spontaneous hypoglycemia, like we've mentioned, sometimes might be seen, especially in, in, with pituitary tumors where hypopituitarism is common. And uh, also a high degree of suspicion should be maintained 
for these secondary causes, especially where the presentation is very unusual. Thank you.